Shivoham 
Good morning, everyone. How are you? I'm so happy to be with you on our weekly satsang. And um, today I'm going to share with you insights on synchronicity. Synchronicity of what spiritual traditions call uh, the state of grace. Some people call it uh, God is on my side. Some people call it meaningful coincidence. Some call it uh, good luck. Some call it being at the right place at the right time. Some call it uh, cosmic creativity. Doesn't matter. But we've all had the experience once in a while when uh, we are thinking of someone and they call you on the phone as soon as you have the thought or when you have a certain impulse a certain desire and through a series of situations circumstances events and relationships uh, the desire is spontaneously fulfilled um, what is happening and uh, i think what i'd like to do if you all like what um, this topic is about synchronicity, synchrodestiny, spontaneous fulfillment of desire, then I shall do a series of satsangs and go into great detail, great detail on the mechanics of manifestation and also on how we can actually use this understanding of the mechanics of manifestation to spontaneously manifest all our desires. Spontaneous fulfillment of desire. Now, of course, if we look at the traditions, spiritual traditions um, from all over the world, including the yogic traditions, it's always, uh, uh, there's always a caution that spirituality means detachment and many people confuse detachment with indifference. Uh, we're not talking about that kind of detachment. Um, the kind of detachment I'm talking about <clears throat> is detachment from doubt, detachment from fear. And there is nothing wrong with desire spiritually. After all, where did desire come from? Um, from the spirit, right? In order to manifest that which is a possibility into that which we call an act actuality. So desire, as I've said always, is a pure, pure potentiality seeking manifestation. Now, of course, as we get in touch with that part of ourself, which is invisible, right? Spirit is invisible. If we get in touch and we anchor our identity in the
non-changing part of us. If we anchor our identity there, and if intention comes from there, then intention automatically organizes its own fulfillment. But when intention is filtered through the conditioned ego mind, then of course the intention becomes weaker. It's coming from the mind. The mind is a conditioned aspect of pure consciousness, which is our true identity. So if the intention is coming from the conditioned mind and not from the source, then obviously it will be weak. And so everyone these days is talking about the law of attraction. The fundamental idea is true, that everything you experience, everything you experience is a mirror of your state of awareness. So in the fight flight response, everything you experience is filtered through fear. In the reactive response, everything that you experience is filtered through ego identity. In the restful awareness response, you start to go beyond ego identity. In the intuitive response, you know context, meaning relationship and story. In the creative response, you have the ability to manifest something that never existed before. In the visionary response, your identity becomes archetypal and you can manifest great and wondrous things in the universe. And finally, in the sacred response, you don't have to do anything. Your presence and a very soft, subtle impulse, some kalp, in the field of all possibilities, in the field of uncertainty, unpredictability, in the field of infinite correlation, in the field of infinite creativity, in the field of what you would call a causal without cause, although there is the cause is around meaning and purpose, but a causal, non local, outside of space time, quantum mechanical interrelatedness, where everything is inseparably entangled with everything else. So remember these words the field of infinite possibilities, where everything is entangled, where everything is in superposition as possibilities where the source can differentiate into any uh, single sentient being as the knower, its process of knowing and that which it knows. So actually manifestation is very, very simple and could, uh, uh, could not happen um, if we didn't uh, know that it's happening all the time. But sometimes it's happening consciously, sometimes unconsciously. Everything that you're experiencing right now, including how you experience your mind and your body and the world, is something that you have created, either consciously or unconsciously. So then um, uh, this is where we go. So now, you know, if we're going to go really deep into this, which I want to, because this is a great opportunity for us to really go deep into it. Kim asks, uh, what is the name of the book that you're reading? I'm not reading a book. I have my notes here, but I'm not reading a book. The book actually does exist in the United States. It's called uh, Spontaneous uh, Fulfillment of Desire. And in the rest of the world, it's called Synchro Destiny. Okay, so now I'm actually... Uh, going to read from my notes some of the most important things that we need to understand about why everything that is manifested in the universe, whether we look at it objectively from the point of view of uh, modern science, modern cosmology, or we look at it subjectively if our uh, ontology uh, is uh, consciousness only, then we can look at it through a different lens. And if our ontology is matter only, then we can also look at it from uh, a different lens. So let me explain to you, and you will have to be patient with me because this is such an important topic. I don't want to skip the big, big picture. And I'd like to have it on record anyway online so that we can revisit in, in the future. Right now, it's only in my notes. Okay, so let's look at the evolution of the universe through the lens of modern science and how that relates to what I call synchro, 
synchronicity or creativity. By the way, I call synchronicity also uh, cosmic creativity. So let's go over some um, nine very interesting facts, and these are absolute facts, okay? Um, number one, at the time of Big Bang, the number of particles created was slightly more than the number of antiparticles. Now, no one knows what the cause of the Big Bang was. Any theories? All, of course, created by the human mind. There were a billion plus particles, billion plus one particles for every billion antiparticles. The particles and the antiparticles anti collided with each other and annihilated each other, filling the universe with photons. And we are using photons right now for this communication as electromagnetic activity of the universe. These were created at the moment of the Big Bang because of the initial balance. Remember, one billion plus one particles to one billion antiparticles. Because there were a few particles left after the annihilation, and these created what we now know as the material world. That little imbalance, 1,000 plus particles, um, 1 billion plus <laughs> one particle uh, to one billion antiparticles. So you and I and the rest of the universe, including the stars and galaxies, are part of a one in a billion leftover stuff from the moment of creation. What's the likelihood of that happening by chance? Number two, the total number of particles left over <clears throat> was 10 to the power of 80 one followed by 80 zeros. If the number of particles were even slightly greater, the gravitational forces would have been greater than the energy expansion, and the young universe would have rapidly collapsed in on itself to form one huge black hole, which would mean no you, no me, no nothing, no stars, no galaxies, no planets. Number three, if the number of matter particles was even slightly less, the universe would have expanded so fast that there would have been no time for the galaxies to form as they did. Number four, if the mass of the neutron was 0.2% less than its actual value, protons would have rapidly decayed into neutrons and no atoms would ever have been formed. Number five, the first atoms were hydrogen. If the strong force that holds the nucleus of an atom was even a fraction percent weaker, deuterium, a stage that hydrogen passes before becoming helium would not have occurred and the universe have, would have remained pure hydrogen. Number six, if on the other hand, the nuclear forces were even a fraction stronger, all the hydrogen would have burned rapidly, leaving no fuel for the stars. Number seven, the universe and its evolution would not have happened if the gravitational forces were exactly the strength they were, the electric, electromagnetic forces and the electrons to be exactly as they were, not a fraction more, not a fraction less, for stars to evolve into supernova and for heavy elements to develop. Number eight, the uh, development of carbon and oxygen essential for the creation of biological organisms required many coincidences to occur and continue to occur for the, from the moment of the Big Bang. And then there is the whole of biological evolution, which I haven't even touched. But let's get to the final existence of you. When you and I were conceived, there were 250 million sperm competing with each other for one ovum. One of them made it, and now we are here on Zoom, on Facebook, having a conversation. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that you and I exist, and that the universe with its stars, galaxies, and planets exists, is technically a highly improbable, almost an impossible event. Every stage is a coincidence. Every stage is a synchronicity. Every stage is meaningful, ultimately, for us to have this conversation right now on Zoom. So the great Indian poet Tagore said that I exist is a perpetual surprise. 
Now, if this is not um, enough to put you in a state of perpetual exaltation and joy, then I would say our humanity is incomplete. Okay, so this is the objective cosmological explanation of why the universe is a conspiracy of improbable space-time events, all happening non-locally. So does this give you a clue? The entire universe and every event in the entire universe, every event with no exception, cosmic inflation, the what do you call the Planck Epoch, everything is absolutely, absolutely precisely orchestrated with exquisite timing and synchronicity for the universe to show up, this scientific fact. So now you have a choice. It is a mere coincidence that every single second, every second, single second, um, there's a coincidence for the universe to exist. Even now, the random, uh, so-called random appearance of particles from virtual particles is creating the universe as we speak from the quantum vacuum. But every single space-time event in every single moment is a coincidence. So either you can say this is absolutely every single microsecond a coincidence is happening by chance or you can say there's an underlying order there's an underlying awareness in which this non-local correlation or synchronicity is being orchestrated in every moment of our existence in every moment of our existence not just every second every nanosecond the universe is a conspiracy of almost impossible occurrences. Impossible. We can't say oh, impossible because it's happening. We can say almost impossible. But if anything is possible, then this is possible. Okay, so this is how we look at it from an objective point of view. But now let's look at this whole thing from a subjective point of view. Okay? So now I'm going to shift completely from the physicalist, materialist ontology then um, to a consciousness, awareness-based ontology. So what is the distance between my thumb and my finger? You'd say it's so many centimeters. But actually in awareness, I can experience them both simultaneously. Visually, I can experience them both simultaneously as I can experience the space. But in awareness, visually, I can also experience this, this, you, me on the computer and everything else behind me and you also are sharing on Zoom perceptual and cognitive space where everything is happening simultaneously, right? Right now, everything is happening simultaneously. But on an objective level, we say this and this are separate. Perceptually, they're not because they are in the same field of visual and cognitive space. I'd say vis visual and perceptual space. This is a perceptual snapshot. This is a perceptual snapshot. This is a perceptual, perceptual snapshot. The computer is a perceptual snapshot. And we are all sharing what we call the field of awareness in which we are all experiencing a band of experience, the umwald, as you call it, uh, less than 1% of what's happening, but we're sharing a spectrum in perceptual and cognitive space. Now, if instead of looking at this and this, I look at the moon, that's also in my visual space, all at the same time. They're all entangled in perceptual and cognitive space. What's the distance between this and this? Well, so many inches. What's the distance between me and the moon and the Milky Way galaxy? Million, you know, for the moon, so many million miles. For the Milky Way galaxy, depending on the stars, so many light years away, but perceptually, visually in the same space right now. No distance between me and a star or the moon or the sun 
or a tree or you right now on Zoom, uh, no distance perceptually. Okay, so the perceptual difference is an inference. It's not real. You say visually it's an inference and it's instantaneously. Now, as far as auditory experience, it takes a little bit of time. Right now, as I'm speaking, it takes a little time. Even light takes a little bit of time. So we are always experience what's happened anyway, the past. So the entire universe is a conspiracy of improbabilities, but each of us experiences it differently based on our karma, which means our constructs. And it is karma that says, I am far away from the Milky Way galaxy because I'm interpreting perceptual difference in perceptual snapshots as something out there. But actually, all is happening in awareness. My body, my mind, this conversation, you looking at it, it's all happening simultaneously in awareness. So whether you look at it objectively or whether you look at it subjectively, all is happening simultaneously. All is happening interdependently, as the Buddhists say, interdependently co-arising and interdependently co-subsiding in the field of infinite awareness. And at a particular moment, perceptually and cognitively, we're exposed to a narrow bandwidth of it, which we call reality, in which we create perceptual distortions, which create the theater of space-time and causality. Now, I know that this is uh, uh, kind of complex, but it's happening. Already we are creating cloud medicine where all specialists can be sitting at the table to help you, uh, our fellow human beings, to tackle any problem in the world. Grand rounds on telemedicine and on and on. The understanding of inseparability and entanglement is such that it is almost incomprehensible um, in, a, in a mental way. But it is not incomprehensible when you start to experience the simultaneity of everything. So now, as we embark on our journey of Synchro Destiny, um, let's, uh, let's uh, um, go over some basic assumptions that we have to make. You always begin with axioms, okay? So here are some very important basic assumptions. Number one, nothing is random or pure chance. Number two, nothing is isolated or independent. All is interconnected, interwoven, interpenetrating. Number three, the universe is an unbroken, continuous fabric, a multidimensional, interwoven, interconnecting holo movement. Number four, the universe is conscious or a projection of consciousness and therefore alive. And number five, the universe is creative. Now, if you are willing to take on these assumptions and if you agree with them and you also have faith in that part of yourself, the invisible, without which there is nothing to be experienced that is visible, then you can start your journey of synchronicity or synchro destiny. So this is the difference between faith and belief. Belief is a cover-up for insecurity um, because we want to believe something, we then say it's true. But you know, if something is real, then, um, uh, then um, you don't have to believe in it, okay? So belief, once again, is a cover-up for insecurity. Faith is the certainty of the invisible that is you without which there is nothing visible. Faith is the certainty of the invisible, which is you, without there is nothing that you can experience visibly. Now you say, okay, the difference between a visual perceptual snapshot and this snapshot and that snapshot is instantaneous. But what about hearing? What about taste? What about smell? What about sensation? The answer is, the same principle applies, okay? Um, when people have synesthesia, they see something, convert it into a sensation. 
So theoretically, um, if you see a tree in the distance, you feel the sensation as if you're right next to it. Is it far away or is it right next to you? The answer is, it depends which way you're approaching it. If you're approaching it from the level of consciousness, nothing is distant, nothing. There's no distance in space-time. Everything is inseparably one, and that creates an amazing experience of joy. Unity consciousness, excitement, exaltation, and more than that. Joy, happiness, um, equanimity, loss of the fear of death, the emergence of platonic values. So is there distance in space-time? Perceptually, yes and no. If you identify with formless being, there's no um, distance in space-time. If you identify with matter, then there's distance in space-time. But actually, everything that we say physical or experiential, experiential is emerging from an entanglement where there is no distance in space-time, but it appears as distance in space-time because certain inferences. And what is the major, major inference? That my perceptions tell me the truth when we know that every perception is a magical lie. Okay, given that, and given that uh, we are going through this process very slowly in order to understand the ultimate reality and also in order to manifest the ultimate reality, here are certain principles uh, that I want to outline before we proceed to the next stage, which will be next week. Okay, so here are the following characteristics um, of synchro synchronicity or what we call manifestation or what we call spontaneous fulfillment of desire or we call um, good luck, synchronicity, joy, etc. Remember, desire is okay. Spiritual, spiritual experience is you will have the ability to manifest any desire. But of course, as you evolve, desires will change from survival to safety, to love, to belongingness, to self-esteem, to relationships, to joy, to meaning, to purpose, to our consciousness, to um, archetypal identity, and then universal identity. Atman is Brahman, that's the journey. But in the meanwhile, Please start to notice these principles. Please start to notice these principles. Number one, synchro destiny and good luck or spontaneous fulfillment of desire is associated and orchestrated by an intention that you have made consciously or subconsciously. And over here, I will also say, the more subtle the intention and the more conscious it is, the more powerful it is. Subtler realms of awareness are more powerful. Number two, uh, synchronicity uh, and synchronistic events have the ability to change and transform your entire life. Number three, these events generate joyful fulfillment because they are significant to us. They are significant um, to us, some meaning, purpose, which is part of our dharma. Number, um, number four, you become aware that every event, actually, if you question it, has meaning for you. Number five, they leave clues to the unity of your inner and outer worlds, because there is no inner and outer world. Um, there's no inner and outer world. We call perceptual activity the outer world and the physical body. We call mental activity um, the mind, the intellect, and ego, but actually they're just fluctuations of rithis of consciousness. And we infer through human constructs inner and outer, but there's no difference. Okay, so synchronicity is a clue to the unity of your inner and outer world, so-called. Um, number six or whatever, many events occur simultaneously. All is happening all at the same time. Number seven, the events are a-causally connected. One doesn't cause the other. 
They're A, causally connected uh, through meaning and purpose of dharma. And number eight, um, everything is processed non-locally, including this experience we are having. You think it's being processed by Zoom, which is true on the on the level of technology, but the experience itself is happening non-locally in consciousness because consciousness doesn't have a location, okay? So that's a clue that you can experience local and non-local awareness at the same time, which is called cosmic consciousness. And number nine, when you become alert to the significance of these events, you move to higher states of consciousness where basically life becomes every second a manifestation of synchronicity which it is you're just missing it through the filter of the conditioned mind which can only think and conceive usually linearly um, synchronicity is contextual relational holistic involves the total universe and if you go to the source of thought with these sensations, sense perceptions, images, feelings, thoughts, orchestrate sankalpa from there, then it happens. Sankalpa is subtle intention, sankalpa, and then settling back in the field of infinite awareness. So step into the field, have the sankalpa, detach from the outcome, reside in that field, and see what happens. Okay, so for today, uh, I would like to actually introduce um, the uh, Mahavakya, which is uh, Aham Brahmasmi, as the first uh, intention or sankalpa to begin the orchestration of synchro destiny. So let's call this the Mahavakya, the Sutra for manifestation today, Aham Brahmasmi which literally means I am the universe. So Brahman is I am, and Brahman is the universe. So Aham Brahmasmi means I am the universe. It also means that your spirit is a field of awareness that connects everything with everything else. It also means that you don't exist in the universe. The universe exists in you. So again, in the Vedanta, there's an expression, Prakritim Swam Vashtabhai Vishrajami Puna Puna. Curving back within myself, I create again and again. So Aham Brahmasmi also means the world is a mirror. Every moment, everything you experience through your senses, everything you think of, you feel, you imagine, you know, is a mirror of your state of awareness at that moment. The world is a mirror. If you want to know what your state of awareness is, look around you, see what's happening, including Look at your own body. So when you understand Aham Brahmasmi, somebody said Satchitanan, we'll come to that next time. But um, um, whenever today um, you think the word Aham Brahmasmi, recognize in every moment that the world is your mirror, that you are the infinite being projecting a particular point of view. But in reality, you are non-local self inseparable from all that exists. So remind yourself today and this whole week till we get to the second lesson in synchronicity that your non-local self functions synchronistically, that you are the source of the reality you experience, that the ground of your being in the field of universal awareness, the ground of your being is the field of universal intelligence and therefore manifests as the universe and all its um, experiences, all that the universe contains. That is it, Aham Brahmasmi. We'll address the other Mahavakyas, but can you remember this week that you are the universe, that your spirit is a field of awareness that connects everything with everything, that you don't exist in the universe, the universe exists in you. And if we can stay with that, then we will move on uh, next week to the second installment of synchronicity. So now I am ready to answer your questions, which I received previously. So every week 
I'll be devoting about 35, 40 minutes to explanation. And today was a, a very detailed explanation on the mechanics of the creation of the universe, whether you look at it objectively or subjectively, it doesn't matter. But now I'm ready to um, answer your questions. So the first question right now is from Shilpi. How do we differentiate between mind and consciousness? So mind is thoughts, feelings, and imagination. Okay? Um, mind is thoughts, feelings, and imagination. And consciousness is the source of that. Mind also is our self-identity as the ego identity. So we say mind is mind, intellect, ego. Mind is where we experience feelings and thoughts. Intellect is where we discern. And thoughts, of course, we use for speech and action and manifestation as well. But that's the mind. And the mind is conditioned through history, economics, culture, so on. What is consciousness? It's the source of the conditioned mind. Number two, how is becoming disconnected from the material world different from severe depression? Actually, it's the same. Disconnected from the material world, disconnected from life, disconnected from emotions, disconnected from um, everyone in that is life, causes depression. It causes anxiety, it causes depression, it causes alienation, it also causes uh, what we call guilt and shame and all those things, humiliation, because um, you replace uh, self-esteem by self-image. That causes sadness. How can we use consciousness for creating an extraordinary life? That's what we're doing right now. Niru Joshi says, how do we define spirit? Pure awareness, pure conscious spirit. Uh, Maria uh, Silvina, do you suggest doing meditation in Sangha or alone, which is better? Um, actually, collective meditation is always uh, uh, creates a field of coherence. So even if we meditated, and if you want, once in a while we can meditate here. Let me know if you like that. We can do meditations uh, here collectively. They create group coherence which means phase and frequency locking in of brain waves so that we're creating a coherent field. And that could definitely help create a more peaceful, just, sustainable, and healthier world. Nicolas says, what is self-awareness? Self-awareness is awareness of awareness. So just uh, try this right now. As you're listening to me or you're watching me, just be aware of that which is listening. So try it right now. As you're listening to me, watching me, just uh, be aware of that which is listening. And if you feel a silent presence, then that's yourself. It's not your mind which might be saying, you know, after he finishes, I'm going to have fried eggs and toast or something like that. Um, Joyce Ashley, how do I purge my heart of hate for a person that actively and continuously seeks to harm me at my workplace? Bring that person into your awareness and fill that person with love. Loving awareness is all that is necessary. Try it with your enemies. This is what Jesus meant when he said, uh, you know, um, what did Jesus say? Forgive your enemies. Love your enemies. Okay, so all you have to do is bring them into your awareness here and bring the light of loving awareness. Is meditation an imaginary illusion? No, meditation takes you beyond all illusions. Um, our Bonnie Rose, our current dominant worldview and ontology are dysfunctional and unsustainable. How can each one of us help change it within our communities, workplaces, and families? By being the change, we want to see the world, but um, not by always just talking about it. Because we can only change 
if we change and if enough of us change, then everything uh, will change. Do you believe in bilocation? How to invoke it? Yes. In the subtle world, everything is not only bilocation, it's everywhere all at the same time. If you're uh, talking on physical bilocation, then basically what you do is um, change your interpretation of physicality as a perceptual experience. So yes, perceptual tricks are possible that can give you the experience or give the other people that the experience that you're in two places almost at the same time. That's called the cities. And if you want, uh, we can do a, a whole course on cities from the second chapter of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is called the Vibhutis. Is it necessary to focus on the different gods and goddesses to connect with God or can you focus on God directly? So God is formless. Therefore, you can't focus perceptually or even cognitively on God, although you can experience God when you experience yourself as formless. Okay. So gods and goddesses are symbolic representatives of archetypes which are higher or expanded states of awareness, information, and energy. And therefore, um, actually, um, uh, part of the experience we can have through gods and goddesses is expanded consciousness. It's remembering all the times that God and gods and goddesses are expanded symbolic representation of, um, of our own self in the direction of our infinite self. How do we define intuition, Shilpi says? Um, intuition is a form of intelligence that is contextual, relational, holistic, doesn't have a win-lose orientation, eavesdrops on the cosmic mind. We tap into it through reflective inquiry and transcendence. Speak of our rain rainbow light body place and multidimensionality. From Gina Parker. So your body is already a rainbow body. Uh, you know, it has a certain color. So when I look at your body, what's um, being reflected are some of the colors of the rainbow, not all of the colors, but your body has all the colors of the rainbow because some colors are absorbed, some are reflected. So you already have a rainbow body. It appears like this. Now, in many Buddhist traditions, when we die consciously, take mother, Mahasamadhi, we can actually experience our rainbow body. And beyond that, of course, is the body of bliss. So some, what is justice? Justice is remembering that karma never loses an address. Vasi Tul Khayar, what to observe when I'm concentrating on my breath? Because thoughts come. When thoughts come, observe the thoughts, but also then shift to observing the breath. Go back and forth. This is called upward and downward stroke of meditation. Um, how to be mindful always. Swapnil Sharma says, uh, just once in a while, stop and ask yourself, am I aware? That's it. As soon as you ask yourself, am I aware? You are becoming aware and mindful. Okay, also, by the way, there are many pranayama techniques where you prolong your breath and then at the end of the prolongation, always uh, through the nose, you hold your breath in stillness, you will access pure awareness. Many ways. And, you know, those are the last three steps of... Um, of the sutras of Patanjali's uh, eight limbs of yoga, dharna, focused awareness, which is also sankalp, dhyan, the flow of meditation, and dharna samadhi. That's the key. And then everything happens by itself. So uh, everybody here is saying once in a while, we should do um, a Gloria Caulfield saying, sending love from the Chopra mind body zone in Lake Nona. A lot of things happening in the Chopra mind body zone right now, um, but also in Lake Nona. We are starting a telemedicine practice global.
uh, please check it out. We'll have a website. And if you're a physician, doctor, healer, integrative doctor, integrative uh, healer, I like to say it's time to move from uh, practicing to healing. All my doctor friends, time to move from practicing to healing. And if you feel you, you want to be part of the telemedicine integrative platform globally, please uh, go to the website, give us your credentials, and we will try and make it happen. Um, we want to provide the best integrative care globally with the best integrative doctors and healers globally, um, wherever they are. Okay, so telemedicine platform, I've reached out to you. Um, please keep reaching out. We're going to get the, the uh, credentials and the experience of integrative healers, um, and uh, we will uh, respond to you as soon as we can. So, my friends, this is uh, basically today's uh, Sangha, and I'm watching your comments. Um, we will definitely plan meditations together. I will pray for Rwanda, uh, Set, and uh, everyone saying uh, deep gratitude, and I can say the same, deep gratitude to all of you. So at this point, I would like to say goodbye until next end Sunday, and we will continue. We will continue very slowly understand synchronicity and manifestation. Oh
Shivoham, Shivoham, Shivoham. 